One of the hottest, yet coolest inventions ever made. They have brought us to some of humanity's highest technological Touchdown. points ever, and lowest points in history. They are essential for space travel, and have made satellites, GPS, the ISS, moon landings, and many other things possible. Rocket engines have broken many barriers in science and exploration, allowing people, rovers, and satellites to get to the moon, Mars, and other celestial bodies. Most rockets today are liquid-fueled, bipropellant rockets, which are much more efficient than solid, monopropellant rockets. But most of this would not even be possible without the work of Robert H. Goddard, a man who pushed the frontiers of space travel and many other industries. If you were to ask someone to think of a rocket, they might think of a spaceship, but a rocket is really just a vehicle propelled by its contents burning. While today they are massive, powerful machines, they had much more humble origins in China in the 13th century. Rockets were first used as a defense against the Mongol Empire, as basically a rocket on an arrow. In time, the Chinese found out that the arrows did not need to be shot with the bow. This led to the making of fire lances, a rocket attached to a stick that would be self-propelled, creating the first true rocket. The Mongols made their own fire lances, which likely led to the spread of rockets in Europe. Rockets were mainly used in war and as fireworks, but once a man named Wan Hu tried to fly using rockets. He attempted to make a chair with rockets strapped to it, and while he did take off, he was never seen again. Between the 13th and 18th centuries, rockets were barely used except as fireworks. Between the 18th and 19th centuries, rockets were used for war again, but again their usage stopped. In 1898, a Russian teacher by the name of Konstantin Tsiolkovsky suggested exploration of space using rockets and using liquids as the fuel for those rockets. However, this was not widely noticed up until 1920, when Robert H. Goddard, an American from Worcester, Massachusetts, began working on the first liquid-fueled rocket, which would later be implemented in almost every modern rocket. And this opened up the frontier of space to all of humanity, creating room for much more exploration than before. Without Goddard's work, we may not have even made it to space. Even early in his life, Goddard was eager to explore space. In 1899, while pruning a friend's cherry tree, his mind wandered, and he began thinking about space travel. Later, Goddard said that, It was one of the quiet, colorful afternoons of sheer beauty which we have in October in New England, and as I looked towards the fields at the east, I imagined how wonderful it would be to make some device which I had even the possibility of ascending to Mars, and how it would look on a small scale if sent up from the meadow at my feet. In 1907, Goddard began building rockets, but they were very simple gunpowder ones, and in 1915, he began testing testing the thrusts of different commercial rockets using a ballistic pendulum. With the measurements he made, he found out that only about 2% of the potential energy was used for thrust. While trying to mitigate this, he found out about the De Laval nozzle. The De Laval nozzle was originally designed by Gustav De Laval, a Swedish engineer who was trying to improve steam engines. De Laval nozzles work by first compressing the gas, causing it to move faster than the speed of sound, then expanding again causing the gas to accelerate further. However, because of its design, the nozzle had to run at a very high speed, which, although was not good for the Laval's work, was perfect for Goddard. Implementing the De Laval nozzle increased the jet velocity from 1,000 to about 7,000 feet per second. After that, Goddard turned to the Smithsonian, asking for funding to support him making a rocket that could reach space. In January 1917, the Smithsonian gave him a $5,000 grant, and Goddard began working on what he called the reloading feature using smaller pieces of solid fuel that would be fed into the rocket, similarly to the bullets in a machine gun. In 1922, however, Goddard decided that the reloading feature would not work, and so began to work on liquid fuel. Propelling a rocket with liquid fuels proved to be much more difficult than with solids. As the liquid oxygen had to be kept cold, the gasoline and oxygen both had to be pumped at a steady rate, and the nozzle had to be kept from overheating. Goddard kept the nozzle cool by piping the liquid oxygen next to it. Goddard made the rocket so that the engine would be above the tanks, and the two fluids piped up to it on opposite sides of the rocket. He did it this way so that he could more easily regulate the flow of the gasoline and oxygen, as well as to increase stability. Finally, after over three years of work on it, the rocket was ready. On March 8, 1926, Goddard went to his Aunt Effie's farm to test the rocket, dubbed Neil, or Goddard 1. Unfortunately, the launch failed, but only eight days later, Goddard tried again, and this time, he succeeded. The rocket flew for two and a half seconds, traveling 41 feet vertically and 184 feet horizontally, landing in a patch of cabbages. On March 17th, 1926, Goddard wrote in his diary, The first flight with the rocket using liquid propellants was made yesterday at Aunt Evie's farm in Auburn. The day was clear and comparatively quiet. The anemometer on the physics lab was turning leisurely when Mr. Sachs and I left in the morning, and was turning as leisurely when we returned at 5.30pm. 
Even though the release was pulled, the rocket did not rise at first, but the flame came out and there was a steady roar. After a number of seconds, it rose, slowly until it cleared the frame, and then at express train speed, curving over to the left and striking the ice and snow, still going at a rapid rate. It looked almost magical as it rose, without any appreciably greater noise or flame, as if it had said, I've been here long enough, I think I'll be going somewhere else if you don't mind. Esther said that it looked like a fairy or an aesthetic dancer as it started off. The sky was clear for the most part, with large shadowy white clouds, but late in the afternoon there was a large pink cloud in the west, over which the sun shone. One of the surprising things was the absence of smoke, the lack of very loud roar, and the smallness of the flame. 1939 was when development started on the V-1 rocket, a solid powered bomb nicknamed the Flying Bomb. Goddard's work would soon end up affecting the entire rocket industry for the rest of history. Germans soon used his work to create a liquid fueled missile that would change war forever. The new missile, called the V-2, used alcohol and liquid oxygen and was 47 feet tall. On June 20th, 1944, the first V-2 reached space, flying up 109 miles. Carrying over a ton of explosive, when the V-2 began use in war, it was devastating, with the rockets that hit their targets killing many people. Although each V-2 killed two people on average, that was because most of the missiles exploded harmlessly in the air. The worst rocket attack killed 567 people and injured about 300. Although this could be seen as great because rockets reached space, it can also be viewed as very bad because of the way that war is now fought. If this had never happened, ICBMs and other such missiles would not be possible, and war would be less deadly. Although liquid-fueled rockets did assist in the making of the V-2, and eventually led to much bigger bombs, it also allowed bigger rockets to push the frontier of space travel. Rockets like the Saturn V from the Apollo program. This rocket was powered by engines which provided 7.6 million pounds of thrust at liftoff. The Saturn V had three stages, another one of Goddard's ideas. Each stage provided thrust until it ran out of fuel, then it dropped off the rocket. This got people to the moon, and made many moonwalks and discoveries on how to do it better. Despite Goddard's accomplishments, he was ridiculed by the New York Times, who said that Goddard's ideas deny a fundamental law of dynamics, and only Dr. Einstein and his chosen dozen, so few and fit, are licensed to do that. The paper also said that Goddard does not know the relation of action to reaction, and of the need to have something better than a vacuum against to react against. The Times did not change this claim until a few days before Apollo 11, when they said, Further investigation and experimentation have confirmed the findings of Isaac Newton in the 17th century, and it is now definitely established that a rocket can function in a vacuum, as well as in an atmosphere. The Times regrets the error. They said this, apologizing to Goddard and admitting their mistake. Later, in 1981, after some test flights, the world's first reusable rocket was launched, the space shuttle. The STS-1 mission was launched on April 12, 1981, aboard the orbiter Columbia. The rocket was composed of two SRBs and three RS-25 engines on the orbiter fueled by a giant rust-colored external tank. The SRBs, solid rocket boosters, provided the majority of the thrust before falling into the ocean, soon followed by the rust-colored tank. Later in the program, they had their first accident with the Challenger orbiter and made many changes to the design. The orbiter exploded on the STS-51L mission on January 28, 1986 due to a failing seal on the SRB. The disaster prompted design changes and slowed the launch frequency. Later, the Columbia orbiter met its demise. TS-107 exploded in the atmosphere because of damage to the heat shield. This happened on February 1, 2003, and made procedures to check the shield in space. The program later ended in 2011 after the STS-135. Many new rockets are being developed today, such as the SLS from NASA and Starship from SpaceX, as well as two that are currently in use, the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. Robert Goddard's work has expanded the aerospace frontier and allowed for many innovations that still affect us today. All of humanity might be excited to see what we can change, including possible asteroid mining and interplanetary travel for humans. GPS and Google Earth are only possible because of satellites launched by rockets, which would have been impossible without Goddard's work. Many more things are yet to come with rockets. Someday we will get people back to the moon and maybe even to Mars. It only depends on our wants, needs, and our budget.